Um, welcome back to our third panel, um, which is going to be chaired by Nesta Lloyd uh, Jones. Sorry. <laughs> Nesta Lloyd-Jones, I should have known that. Uh, Assistant Director, Welsh NHS Confederation. Um, this afternoon's session is uh, focusing on looking after the mental well-being of the health and care workforce. So welcome to all our panel members this afternoon, who Nesta will introduce individually. Uh, but yeah, Nesta, Director, uh, Assistant Director, Welsh NHS Confederation. Nesta has over a decade of experience working in policy and public affairs in Wales. And after completing her law degree and being called to the bar in 2004, Nesta worked at Welsh Women's Aid for six years as Legal Issues Coordinator. She's also been, uh, became part of the award-winning external affairs team at Macmillan Cancer Support and was a consultant for Rape Crisis England and Wales. Um, welcome, Nesta. Handing over. Thank you very much, Angela, and um, I don't know how we're going to follow that amazing choir, really. Um, I was at the back filming a lot of it. Uh, absolutely, you know, after lunch, I think it's always brilliant to, to get a bit of energy, get us all standing, clapping, singing. So um, I'm not sure how whether you're going to be standing, clapping and singing with, with our panel, but hopefully we'll be able to to talk about you know, the important issue of the mental health and well-being of the workforce. And I'm delighted to be co-chairing um, this session this afternoon. Um, just before I introduce my other um, co-chairs, Ollie and Angie, um, as Angela said, I'm Nessa Lloyd-Jones. I'm the Assistant Director at the Welsh NHS Confederation. Um, so for those who don't know, um, the Welsh NHS Confederation is the membership body for uh, the NHS bodies, that, um, all the NHS bodies in Wales. Um, so the seven health boards, the three trusts, so uh, Public Health Wales, Valindra and the Welsh Ambulance Service, and the two special health authorities, um, Health Education Improvement Wales and Digital Health and Care Wales. And most of my work, my day-to-day -day job, is uh, working very closely with NHS leaders to um, influence uh, government and to raise awareness of the key issues um, for them. And as Sally mentioned this morning, one of the key areas for us at the Welsh NHS Confederation over the last six years is around promoting um, the benefits of the arts um, to people's health and well-being, both in regards to patients and our population, but also uh, to staff. So we've had an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the Arts Council of Wales for um, the last um, six years. And as Sally mentioned, and, and we've uh, been highlighting previously, the partnership is more than a written document uh, that we both agreed on six years ago. And I think um, somebody asked uh, me recently, what, what is the success of the, the MOU and, and why has it been you know, well received? And I, I would say one of the things is the fact that we have had a number of people in Wales who have been there since the beginning, whether it's Angela Wahoon, Sally at the Arts Council. And I think having that consistency when it comes to partnership working is always key. We all know each other um, uh, you know very well we know when to ring uh, each other and to share ideas with each other as well and the MOU and the partnership you know we, we signed the first one in, in 2017 and when we looked at the, the signing the second one in 2020 uh, we reflected on what the situation was in 2020 we were in the middle of the pandemic um, both my, myself and, and Sally were, were highlighting the impact that the pandemic was having on respective workforce, whether it was the health and care workforce or whether it was um, arts and creativity. And so we, we made sure that in the second MOU, we specifically highlighted and put in there um, how we would um, support and look at ways of supporting um, the the well-being of both um, the arts and also uh, the health sector's well-being. And um, I'm you know, really pleased that Aled will be talking a little bit later around cultural kutch, which is you know, a key aspect of that. 
Another key factor um, over the last six years has been the, um, the embeddedment and, and the introduction in a number of health boards of the arts and health coordinators, many are here today, and also arts and health teams. So I know a lot of the health boards have um, arts and health teams uh, established and are really you know, making a significant difference on, on the ground in their respective organisations. And uh, as Sally highlighted, you know, internationally and, and across the UK, uh, we are being seen as, uh, you know, a, a golden pillar, a thread of, of um, how things can be done. And I know uh, our colleagues across the border in England uh, are looking at, you know, the establishment of arts and health coordinators and, and how that uh, is working. Um, the vision going forward... Um, it's clear that there, you know, more needs to be done uh, and there needs to be more awareness and understanding around the access that arts and creativity can have on people's health and, and well-being. And I think that's where the, the long-term um, thinking is. While a significant amount has been done over, you know, the last six, seven years, but also across, you know, a number of decades around arts and health. I think, you know, for, for me, talking to NHS leaders, it's really positive that they are talking about arts and health. They do always ask questions um, when we talk about arts and health, you know, what differences it has had, the good practice and the importance of sharing good practice. And we do have that opportunity in Wales to share good practice. And um, you'll be able to, you know, hear some of those, uh, you know, spotlight on, on some of those programmes um, on in this session now. So um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Angie Oliver. Deputy Director of Workforce and Organisational Development at Health Education Improvement Wales. Um, so Angie will say uh, a few words. Diolch Bau. Can you hear me? Now I'm there, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I don't think I can sort of stand like that and read my notes at the same time. But um, just uh, in terms of the, what Nesta said about the choir, they're fantastic, were they? And, mm -hmm. and actually, I was looking around the room, and every single face had a smile. And it just sort of spoke to me about the power of, of music. Um, so um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, I'm really, really excited by what I've seen so far, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day as well. Um, and as Nesta said, I currently work for um, Health Education and Improvement Improvement Wales, uh, which is one of the special health authorities that she mentioned. And together with our partners, uh, Social Care Wales, we developed and launched and are currently implementing both the Workforce Strategy for Health and Social Care and more recently the Mental Health uh, Strategic Workforce Plan for, for Health and Social Care. And the Deputy Minister um, mentioned both of those this morning. And, and I suppose before I just talk very, very briefly about those. Um, I've probably got, so my um, current role is a sort of HR, personnel, workforce, uh, and organisational development role. Um, and I've probably got quite a different background uh, to many of my HR workforce colleagues in that I did actually train as a classical musician. And I'm looking out here with all the talent in the room and I'm feeling, oh my goodness, why don't I practice anymore? Or why don't I play anymore? Um, or at least not as much as I should. Um, so, you know, I've got a music degree and yet it's, it really is sit on the sitting on the shelf but a day like today has really inspired it from me from the moment I walked through the door to listen to the harpist my first thought was oh isn't that so lovely you know and it does it just has the power to calm you doesn't it music so you know coming here today has really made me personally reflect on the way that music can can relax, can energise, can inspire, can really, really make your well-being so much better. And, and not just music, but all of the arts, but from my point of view, particularly music. And I've always got music playing in my head. I'm always wary of, of actually describing that to people. But if, if you are a musician, you probably understand there is always something a tune in my head. Anyway, enough about me. Um, so uh, going back to the strategy and the, and the mental health workforce plan, if you look in those strategies, there's seven themes. Um, there is a theme which is around engaged, motivated, healthy workforce. Um, but our ambition is to have an engaged, motivated, healthy workforce with the capacity, 
confidence and competence to deliver the services that they need to, um, to, to deliver to the, to the people of Wales. We deliberately did not put a wellbeing theme in it because we felt fundamentally everything we do has to be in support of the wellbeing of the workforce. So there are seven themes in, in the, organ in the um, strategy and in all of the workforce plans that we're currently developing as well as the mental health one. So all the actions that we want to take are to support the well-being of the workforce. So it's really, really um, embedded as a golden thread. Um, although we're talking about our own workforce at the, today, um, we are also, in terms of the mental health plan, we're also supporting some AHP Pathfinder uh, projects. They're just around, about to start in some of the health boards. And they are looking at some of the arts in health works. So there's some around music um, and drama and art that are going on. So that's about our patients as well. But it's really important that we look after the well-being of our workforce because... A, they're our population, but also, if they're not well, how can we expect them to support and care for the people that we serve as well? So it is absolutely Im important. Um, so during um, COVID, HEIW, um, taking the lead for the, as the statutory workforce organisation, we actively wanted to make a very quick, very um, uh, purposeful wellbeing offer to staff. And we set up a one-stop shop and there is a QR code there, that website will take you to lots and lots and lots and lots of resources. And some of them are, are sort of individual self-help type resources right through to traumatic support. Um, they are available to everybody, um, but certain ones would, would obviously only be uh, available to health and, and social care staff. But anyone can access that website and some really good stuff on there. And we've also been delighted to work with both Alid and, and Tanya in terms of what they're going to talk about today as well. So I'm not going to steal their thunder, but we've been absolutely delighted to work with, with both of them to try out some things and also to make some things available for the, for the staff in NHS Wales and social care as appropriate as well. Um, and we're, we've still got those partnerships running. So um, really, 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 really good work. Um, but also, um, when we look at, and we've been talking about some evaluation today in, in some of the sessions, and, and just to evaluate what people think of these sessions as well. And some of these sessions we run out of hours and some are in hours. So people are giving up their own time as well. And some of that is some of the value that you can see. And there's a particular emphasis that we're putting um, on, on staff wellbeing, particularly staff who are faced with quite significant um, trauma related things that they're de dealing with there's some really um not nice stuff that our staff are, are dealing with but it's not only for them it is for everybody um, we're currently offering a suite of um sessions called moving for self-compassion which again is is in tanya's um area and that has really really been popular with our staff and, and the wider um, NHS Wales so um, you know people are asking can we have more and that is really fantastic and I suppose the other thing you know we've got some big projects going on and I haven't mentioned them all but also the little things as well and it's the little things that we can encourage our staff to do individually as organisations you don't need permission I always once had a dream that you know wherever I worked there'd be a piano um, I recently bought a digital piano and it's in HEIW for people to play. So it is the little things, you know, a few hundred quid. Uh, it, it, is, it isn't big. One of my team is a, um, a very, very talented semi-professional artist. So she's been running some, um, I'm going to get it wrong now, paint and sip sessions. You know, and it's been fantastic. People have gone, I'm going to go, I, you know, I don't need, even know one end of a paintbrush from another. But, you know, it's the ability to come and to share and to be creative. So those sessions have been absolutely fantastic about, you know, improving mindfulness, helping the well-being. So it doesn't have to be a huge effort, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. It's the little things, as that's what St David said, isn't it? It's the little things as well as, as the big things. So um, I'm not going to take any more time, but I just, you know, before I hand over to my, my colleagues, I always used to say that my initial career was really far removed from my current one. And yet, I'm increasingly coming to the opinion that actually it isn't. You know, the creativity I have or had 
have as a musician, I bring to my portfolio that whole testing, doing things differently, reshaping, could it go a different way, etc. It's all there, it's still evident in, in the way that I tackle my portfolio, and it's full of possibilities. And most recently, I'm really proud to say, we have started a choir. So I think Rosie's still in the room, and I don't know whether the Oasis Choir is still in the room, but I'll be coming to you for tips, please. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand back to Nesta, I believe. So so thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Angie. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, our other co-chair, Ollie, oh, <laughs> Oliver John, and then that. Tanya. <laughs> going that way. Going that way. <laughs> so Oliver John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ollie John. I'm the manager of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Wales. I pause for a massive round of applause. No, I won't. So, <laughs> all those psychiatrists. I've got the beard and everything. It's brilliant. <laughs> Just to say what an amazing event this is, what work has gone into this programme. Um, it's incredible. And I think it's so timely and hopefully the start of know, pressure, but more events like this. You know, it's fantastic. Um, I know I don't need to tell people in this room about the transformative effect that arts can play on mental health. Um, you all do it, and there's amazing examples, but we were all, we're all obligated to keep reminding people, keep telling people who don't understand that yet about the value of this work as well. Um, so as a college, about five years ago, we started on a bit of a journey to do more in this space, um, and we needed a, a lot of help, and we relied on someone uh, called Patrick Jones. Some of you may know Patrick. He's a poet, author, and playwright based here in Newport. Uh, incredible man, lovely, lovely guy, very, very modest and very giving with his, his time. Um, if you do know Patrick, if you know his tweets, the irony of working for a royal college and his personal views on the royal family, I mean, he's a match made in heaven. So <laughs> pulse raising whenever he tweeted, but it was brilliant. Um, so Patrick became our resident artist in Wales. And, and part of that was we were very, very keen. We laughed about it a lot, but to avoid what felt like tokenism. We wanted to do really meaningful work with Patrick, but we more than anything wanted him to shape what we were doing across Wales. And that meant not just projects, but how we incorporated the arts into kind of clinical settings. And it aligned really well with the creations which have come out the last few years, the investment into, into different areas of the service too. So one thing Patrick did, which um, we're forever grateful for, we weren't expecting, but has been magic for us is he introduced us to a whole variety of artists and our reflection was there's amazing work going on um, very much community based people are incredibly passionate people are doing things quite often on a shoestring but achieving amazing amazing things and through some really strategic partnerships with organizations like literature wales hi louise and others around the room, we were able to get really informed about how we best invested and supported artists like we all say, COVID hit, we tried to do things differently and working on a number of bursaries for different programs, we're able to work with artists within community groups, quite often linked to third sector, voluntary sector organisations or directly with health boards as well. And the impact that people can go delivering that work, in many settings it can have a transformational effect which is very different than someone going into four white walls of a clinical environment as well. So there's that understanding for us again as psychiatrists working in the profession, but it's very much around collaboration with others. Uh, one thing I was really keen to touch upon, and it's probably the last thing before I sit down, um, was about the specifically the mental health support and the well-being support for both people working within creative industries and working with the NHS. And I think it's fair to say anyone working within mental health, there are unique challenges. You're hearing very traumatic experiences from people in, in very real time. Um, you take a lot of that away with you. Uh, regardless of whether you're, as I say, in four walls of the clinical environment or working in the community, you're quite often seeing the same people with the same problems, um, but just in different ways. And I think there's a real learning around kind of if that equivalence of support that we see within a typical traditional NHS, as is now changing to something new, also available to people working within the creative industries. And I think that's something we need to reflect on around that equivalence and around that appropriateness of support. Um, but I think that's, that's probably the last thing to say other than we're still very much learning, but um, it's been a process we've been learning with people with lived experience and people who are doing this work fantastically, and it's been massively rewarding. It's changed our view of how we 
feel services can and should be delivered, which are ultimately going to make an impact upon people's lives, families' lives, and communities' lives as well. So I think that's probably it, but, but thank you for the opportunity to speak as well. Lovely. Thank you very much, um, Ollie. So as you've um, heard already, and I think from the sessions I went to this morning, there's been a lot of discussion around, you know, the NHS and the clinical model of health and, you know, the need to shift to more patient-centred, person-centred outcomes, what matters to people, really. Um, and I think we're all on, on that journey. Um, you've heard from the three chairs. Um, so now it's an opportunity for us to hear a little bit about some of the award-winning programmes that we are very lucky to have in Wales. So I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr Tanya Akron, dance movement um, psychotherapist and company director, who will be uh, talking about the Body Hotel. Thank you. Buenas tardes. That's how you say it in Spanish. I'm from Puerto Rico, um, but I've been adopted by the UK for 12 years now, traded the tropics for this, but it's worth it, I, prom I promise. Um, yes, I'm the founder of The Body Hotel. I'm a dance movement psychotherapist and a researcher. I know we have two in the room. We're 11 in Wales, can you believe it? And I work at, at the University of South Wales, uh, particularly in the MA in Arts, Health and Wellbeing. So I see some of our students, I'm very proud of you, <laughs> and Creative Therapeutic Arts. So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what happens when you start a company <laughs> and uh, you have to kind of see where your puppies lie. So we had many puppies. Uh, I call them puppies. Um, the first puppy was looking at uh, employee well-being. And research indicates that the first indicators of staff risk are in the body. So how then, you know, how then do we translate this into an ongoing practice, right? When people usually, when you say dance movement psychotherapist, people go, <gasps> Yeah, so trying to integrate body-based interventions across all whales. The second puppy was uh, that as a social enterprise, we're very much involved with the LGBTQ plus community and marginalized communities. So we provide therapeutic workshops for different community organizations across Wales, particularly Glitter Cymru, uh, that very, very much focuses on works with, work, working with refugees and asylum seekers, so I'm very, Shout out to the choir, <laughs> representing as well. And uh, our third puppy is uh, advocacy for arts therapies and looking at how we can contribute to the wider network. And you know, I, I'm part of different networks. We're trying to have more of a presence around well-being, looking at supervision and looking at training and supporting arts, health, and well-being projects. And so this puppy, <laughs> the employee well-being puppy, was uh, a beautiful project funded by HEIW and Arts Council Wales. They funded first a pilot in 20, 2021, 2022, and then we wanted to scale up now. We wanted to bring 39 sessions, I think it's ended up being a bit more, <laughs> across Wales, and look at different pockets of ways in which we could reach employees, right? So we did intensives, we call them intensives, but we, we changed it Saturday mornings because intensives felt a bit uh, overwhelming for people. Um, it, those were in person. We also wanted to do little, little tiny tasters, so 20 minute uh, workshops called Cochquinho. These were hosted on the Guetla platform through HIW. And then we also had our online, online offerings in the evening. So we were trying to just reach wide, wide. Also, we wanted to commission movement specialists across Wales and internationally to bring little tiny I know, it's almost like everything's a little tiny, but some tasters of movement strategies and uh, create little videos for, for us, five, six minutes, for, for movement to be accessible at any time, right? And then um, 
We're also doing what's called, it's like the big word, a social return on investment evaluation, which is uh, looking at the value and how people's experiences kind of influence, you know, the impact these projects could have in the future. So there were a lot of challenges, there are some challenges because things are changing. People are fed up with being online, but also online allowed us to reach, you know, North Wales and reach far and wide rather than having to, to only focus on one locality and we're based in Cardiff. So that was kind of a challenge and also um, getting people to go, okay, this is a little bit outside our comfort zone. Movement is outside our comfort zone, but the body is at the base of it all. Um, the other interesting bit of this was that from these tasters, we, we grew. We had new partners approach us. Halva uh, was very interested in having us. And then Swansea Bay, we're like, we're having, uh, we're turning our libraries into a well-being space. Can you come in? So then it's kind of snowballed from that. And, and it's been really interesting to go into a hospital space and actually be of service in that way. And one of our really Really like that. Those groups are really in my heart. We talked about uh, an Aaron Bevan this morning. Uh, we went to the Grange and uh, worked with the nurses in the ICU, and they were already negotiating. Can we do 10 minutes instead of 20? Can we do 15? Minutes? And we're like. Okay, we'll try for 15. <laughs> and then they were covering each other across the, the shifts and br coming in with a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue, a lot of burnout, and then coming out going, wow, I really needed that, right? So we're really trying to see if we can shift the focus a bit more to go into those spaces and provide the respite that, that, that we need. Um, I think that's... And then also, uh, I, I need to give a big shout out to the arts health and coordinators because Kamtaf Morganog, I don't know where S is, um, really was an amazing partner because they were in charge of all referrals. They're like, come in, it's all right. <laughs> and it's really important to have that person believe in you. And then the system believes in what you do. And it starts to really, really, really take a knock on effect. So um, just to, to wrap up, because I have to practice what I preach, <laughs> I just wanted to have a moment. I'm going to steal 30 seconds. Is that all right? OK. Um, <laughs> um, have a moment, have a moment, place your hands on your chest. Yeah, and then tune into your body a second. And I want you to open your eyes and offer to your table a gesture about today. Just have a moment, gesture can be anything. Have a moment around your tables, offer them a gesture. Yeah, any gesture. There we go. Excellent, all right, so we have the... Beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, in a nutshell, we will always say more with our bodies than we can say with our words. So, thank you very much, and thank you for, for having us. Thanks for me. Lovely. Thank you, Tanya. And I think we're all smiling again because uh, that's one gesture from, from this morning. I think the energy again um, from, from the day. So I know um, there are a number of arts and health coordinators here today. And it's fantastic, like I said, to see so many of you here. And um, arts and health coordinators have been mentioned on numerous occasions uh, today. So I'd now like to invite Joanne Square from uh, Swansea Bay University Health Board uh, to, to say a few words. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I'm not from around here either. Uh, I'm from Norway originally, uh, but I now live and work in Swansea Bay. Um, and I'm here to talk about our Sharing Hope project and why it's worth investing in the arts over a long period of time and what that can look like as opposed to the more sort of traditional short-term funding pots that we often see. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a very short background for Sharing Hope, uh, a little bit about where we are now and then where we hope to take it into the future. And I'll try to stick to five minutes uh, talking about something that's taken up a considerable amount of my life for the past two years, but <laughs> You know, we'll see. Um, so, Sharing Hope is an arts and health approach to staff well-being. Um, and, I mean, 
like Ollie mentioned, we all know the positive impact the arts can have on our mental health. I mean, we can't really imagine our lives without art, right? It's, it wouldn't be worth living. Uh, the right song can make us dance with joy. Um, seeing a play or reading a book can, can help us cry and grieve and everything in between. Um, so Sharing Hope is really about sort of bringing that into a healthcare setting or seeing how we can bring that into a healthcare setting uh, to help our staff uh, heal and sort of move forward stronger together because they've been through a lot as part of the job, but especially lately they've been through a lot. So in 21, when um, we were looking at applying for uh, the Arts and Minds project, so Sharing Hope's funded by Arts and Minds program, I should say, uh, which is the Arts Council of Wales and the Bering Foundation. Very grateful for that program. Back then, uh, 21, coming out of, you know, uh, all of that, and um, we, we were getting some very worrying statistics about our staff's mental health and suicidal ideation and even suicide. Uh, the trends were not looking good. You know, they're not, the, the statistics are worrying on a good day, and that was not a good day. So uh, when I sort of started asking around, you know, if we got this money, what should we spend it on? Uh, the instant reply was staff well-being, staff suicide prevention, you know, no big ask at all. Um, and so when, you know, when we applied and we got the money, um, I was teamed up with Jane Whitney, who's joining us today from Lanzarote, I believe, on, on uh, well, watching us, I should say, uh, enjoying a well-deserved holiday. Um, so I teamed up with Jane Whitney, our uh, suicide and self-harm quality improvement uh, strategic lead, whatever. And, uh, and she, um, she's got, I think, something like 25 years of experience as a mental health nurse, uh, ward manager, and now in a more strategic job. And she, you know, I wasn't sure how that was gonna go, but you know, she instantly bought into the idea and we've developed a really, really close relationship and a way of developing this project. I had no idea, you know, I had no idea it would go this way. Um, so we also commissioned a lead artist, Ginny Hearth, who's also an art psychotherapist. And we started looking at, okay, how can we access our staff? Because that's the first problem. You know, they're working 13 hour shifts or whatever, and they don't really have time to do anything, let alone, uh, you know, eat lunch. Um, so we started looking at, you know, experimenting. Can we meet them in the staff canteen? Can we invite them with their families to a beach day out? We tr tried and failed over uh, about a year. And we sort of f worked out a way that we could, we could make it work. And uh, so we've, we basically found that it works best when, well, it's crucial that the staff have to be able to access the activity during their work, work hours. We can't expect them to take time out of their precious free time. Um, it works best when it's commissioned by a ward manager or, or a service manager so that it's from the top down. They get permission and they, it's a gesture of saying have this time for yourself with your colleagues to do something nice. Um, it's, you know, the art sort of works as an open door. So if you work in healthcare and you have a, a mental health or a health problem, that can be quite uh, difficult to address. You know, you have to go to a colleague and say, I'm actually not sure I want to live anymore, or I'm actually not okay at all with the things that I've experienced. Um, and so by offering them an arts activity, it's sort of a fairly harmless um, approach. And they can come on in. It's a completely leveling experience. You know, healthcare is very hierarchical. <laughs> hierarchical. And so having a level, level field where everybody's just around the table doing some textile, doing some art, maybe writing some poetry, whatever it is, collaborative or individual, it sort of flattens the field and they can have honest conversations outside the work environment. And our feedback shows that that's one of the most valuable aspects of what we've done so far. Um, the arts invites reflection. Um, we know there's a lot of trauma that sits really deep down with people, people who've had to, you know, um, show kids away while their parents were dying on a ward, for example. You know, horrible stories like that, which just breaks your heart. And uh, nobody can really just, you know, it doesn't just 
uh, sort of fly off the armor. That stuff stays with you. So these art sessions, are, you know, it's a place for people to start to resolve some of that. Um, and where was I? Yeah, so we've kind of worked out this model now where um, we have wide engagement activities. Anybody's welcome. It's, a, you know, it's advertised on, um, through lots of different channels, including our intranet. Then we have more commissioned bespoke groups for service areas like ITUs, intensive care units, uh, maternity wards that have been through particularly harsh uh, or hard times. Uh, and then ultimately we have sort of one-to-one -one support uh, and that's where the art psychotherapist background comes in handy with our lead artist. So we're always taking care of people all the way to one-to-one -one sessions and ultimately referral onto a specialist service if that's necessary as well. Um, and that's proven really successful. Um, I'm out of time already. Yeah. Two minutes, right, cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh man, I'll be really quick then. Right, so after about a year of delivering Sharing Hope, we've had over 100, 850 staff members engaged with our artists. Uh, over 150 just in the last month, which is a bit nuts. Uh, and it means that um, basically we are, we're at our limits now. We can't, we can't take any more, but we need to grow. Um, and that's kind of one of the things I wanted to say is that there's a risk of putting something in place that people depend on. If you put support in for people and then, up oh, funding's over, that's not cool. You know, that can have a very opposite effect. So we have one year now of funding until uncertain times next sort of autumn. So we're going to work like hell, basically, for a year. We've done lots of trial and error. We're just going to take away the error now and do this as well as we can. <laughs> we kind of, you know, we have a pretty good idea what works. And we're going to do that full on for a year. And during that time, we're going to increase the sort of richness of our evaluation so that hopefully we can show the, the financial benefit of what we're doing. Because that's how we measure things in money. But it's resources, basically. If we lose a member of staff uh, to, you know, uh, long-term sick or they don't want to do their job anymore, that costs us like, you know, tens of thousands of pounds potentially in retraining, you know, getting agency staff and whatever it is. So if, and that pretty much pays for sharing hope for like six months. So if, if we can have, if we can prove that people aren't going off sick or people aren't getting fed up with their work, because it's a pretty thankless job, then uh, we're basically, that's, that's our existence uh, validated, you know? And hopefully we can then find funding for it uh, permanently so that we have a safe platform to, to build on. I, am I done? Time up, yeah. <laughs> cool, all right. I've got tons of other stuff I want to say, but that's fine, fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to, you know, if anybody has, is interested, I'd love to meet up one-to-one -one and talk about this more in depth. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, just a snapshot and I think we've all had a little bit of a snapshot and we're all here for the rest of the afternoon but now I'd like to hand over to Ala Jones the project manager of Cultural Kutch. So proud our pub. Um, yeah so my name's Ala Jones I'm a project manager for Cultural Kutch. Um, what is the Cultural Kutch? So the Cultural Kutch, um, it's an online creative wellbeing resource. So there's lots of work being done kind of in uh, arts and health with a focus on patients. So this is a focus on kind of staff and its healthcare workforce. Um, the project's a kind of cross-sector uh, kind of piece of work. So it's arts and health sectors working together really um, with kind of artists from Wales kind of creating content to kind of inspire um, and then kind of uh, help with the wealth, uh, well-being and healthcare um, of workers. Um, Culture Coach has commissioned about 70 artists so far and I've kind of seen lots of faces here from artists we've commissioned. Um, all these on about Patrick Jones, we worked with Patrick Jones, we did some amazing kind of writing pieces, Tanya's done stuff for the Body Hotel. Um, so, so it's kind of, kind of really nice kind of bring all these artists together why do we create the Cultural Kutch? Um, again, it's kind of, it was created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, really. 
um, kind of having discussions with the kind of uh, health sector and finding out about the kind of trauma, uh, trauma and pressures that workers were under. So it's been designed in a kind of consultation with Health Education Improvement Wales, um, the NHS Confed, Social Care Wales, and we're also working with Public Health Wales as well. So we're trying to get kind of all these organisations um, together. We've had funding from Welsh Government. Um, so and it's part of the kind of ongoing programme really of partnership uh, within kind of arts and health to kind of I guess to show the kind of how um, users can engage with the arts and kind of benefit their, their health and well-being. Um, so like I said, so it's a national resource. We've commissioned 70 artists across a range of different art forms. So there's everything there from kind of craft, dance, uh, kind of music, circus, writing, um, and it's completely bilingual. So I've, we've done a video which I think will kind of probably explain it a lot better in the next two minutes than I can. So just watch this and enjoy. So Mock, that was in that video, he's a pharmacist and he dances, and his dance CV is amazing. So it's kind of really nice to kind of work with an artist like that. Um, so I guess kind of what next for the project? Well, we're kind of um, evaluating the project at the moment, kind of taking stock, um, seeing the kind of impact we've had really, um, and seeing where we kind of go next, kind of what opportunities are there. Um, the feedback from users kind of tells us that we've created some amazing kind of content, commissioned some brilliant artists. Um, and the kind of product is, is really, really good. So it's just looking at kind of where we go next. We've got funding until March 2024. Um, and then after that, we're kind of just looking at to kind of see what kind of those opportunities are out there. So I'd really encourage you to kind of go to the website. Um, so culturalcuts.wales, Cuts Creative Gorak Cymru, kind of fully bilingual. Um, take a look, there's feedback um, kind of forms on there as well. So just give us your feedback, let us know what you think, it'll help us drive the project forward. Okay, Diolch Thank you. So I'm sure Alad is very relieved that technology this afternoon has uh, worked and it's lovely to, to see the video and for somebody, I've, I've sat through a number of the panel um, discussions with the, the bids that Cultural Kutch have had and 
they're all amazing and the quality of um, the applications have been top, top standard and it's inspired me to think, right, which one of these can I do at home with my family? And I think that's, that's the key, is making it accessible, but also you know, making it available uh, to, to the staff within the health and care, um, but also wider. You know, there's over 100,000 people working in the NHS, and you know, I'm sh a number of them, I'm sure, you know, are, like Angie, have a background or an understanding around uh, the art, and, and it's tapping into that a little bit, I think. So hopefully we've been able to give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the projects uh, across Wales. I know we've overran a little bit, so uh, I know Angela's uh, put her orange card up, the red card. <laughs> Luckily she hasn't got any other cards, but um, <laughs> I'll pass on to Angela because I'm sure you'll say where we're all meant to be going next. But Diolch and thank you very much for, for listening this afternoon.